So hi everyone, I'm Juan Estrada with District 5 United. Welcome to tonight's San Jose Council District 5 Candidate Forum hosted by District 5 United and the Si Se Puede Collective with Spanish and Vietnamese translation. Vietnamese translation is sponsored by United Neighborhoods of Santa Clara County. And uh, District 5 United strives to improve the quality of life in East San Jose and San Jose as necessary. We partner with neighborhood leaders and galvanize residents throughout the city. Primarily, we facilitate community meetings open to the public to facilitate communication between de decision makers and residents. We hold events at times. And lastly, we engage in advocacy as the need arises. Our first citywide advocacy was over a decade ago when we led the fight to preserve city grants to neighborhood associations. And I'll hand it off to Andrea. Great. All right, well, thank you everybody again for joining us. Uh, my name is Andrea Portillo. I am the Community Organizing and Policy Director with Somos Mayfair. And like Juan said, uh, this forum is being co-hosted with D5 United and the Si Se Puede Collective. Um, the Si Se Puede Collective, for folks who don't know, uh, we are five nonprofits in the Mayfair uh, neighborhood area working together to ensure our community has what they need to thrive. Um, by coordinating and aligning the work of our organizations, the Si Se Puede Collective envisions a rooted and thriving community where resilient families have confidence in their gifts, choices, and dreams. Um, and the organizations that make up the Si Se Puede Collective are Amigos de Guadalupe, Grail Family Services, the School of Arts and Culture at the Mexican Heritage Plaza, Somos Mayfair, and Veggie Lucian. So thank you again. I'm going to pass it on um, back to Juan. All right. So the candidates in alphabetical order are Nora Campos and Peter Ortiz. Our translators are Jordi Vidales and Christine No. Ms. Rain Mendoza will be our timekeeper. Candidates, please indicate when you are done with each response by saying thank you. If you use up your time, Ms. Rain will tell you thank you to let you know your time is up and we'll continue to until uh, you're done. We will begin with self-introductions limited to five minutes per candidate. First is Nora Campos, followed by Peter Ortiz. Nora. Thank you. I'm going to start with thank you for the opportunity to be here with you uh, this evening to talk about what I hope to be able to accomplish when I am elected to the San Jose City Council. For those of you that I've worked with in the community for over 20 years, it is good to see you. For those of you that I will have the opportunity to work with, I look forward to that day. I served on the City Council in 2001 to 2010, and then went on to the State Assembly in 2010, 2016. But before that, my family came from South Texas, and my dad came out here for a better life, left Texas. And then my mom followed after he was able to find a job washing cars. And I remember as a child thinking that, wow, we live in such a great place because there's a sense of community. I have to hand it to my mom that she was really good about making sure that the involvement that she had within the church, that she was able to build a community for my brother and I and our family. So grew up thinking that the, the ladies at Guadalupe Church were my tias. And I didn't realize till I was much older that they were my mom's friends, but that's what my mother did. And I'm sure that's what a lot of other mothers do within the community. My son went to Alum Rock School District. And I think the one thing that I loved about the school that he went to, which was Adelante, was that there was a sense of community. Everyone looked out for their children. And so as a council member, what I'm going to do and continue to do is make sure that we create space for our families to thrive. When I was on the city council, we created youth centers, community centers that fully were funded by services that represented the community. We made sure that we built parks so that you could walk out your front door and go to your neighboring parks. We made sure that we provided services and additional assistance so that our small businesses could thrive here in East San Jose. I took on one of the biggest blighted areas in East San Jose, which was Story and King. And when I took that on, everyone said, are you crazy? Do you want not understand the violence and the gangs and the unwanted activity and criminal activity that's there? Well, a lot of you don't know this, but my life was threatened. 
And they were trying to intimidate me because they wanted their activity and their livelihood to continue in our neighborhood. And collectively as a community, we said no. And I will never forget, Juan and Maria came into my office and they said, Ms. Campos, in Spanish, they said, please do not give up. You are the hope that we are hoping for so that we can have a place where we can go and shop and we can bring our families when we want to dine out. And you know what? I took on that fight and now it's a thriving economic engine. We increased the tax revenue by 105%, brought four financial institutions so our families could actually have a bank right in their own backyard. Those are just a few of the things that I've been able to do. But I will promise you this, that we will work together. I will work close with our community-based organizations because they're doing wonderful work and they picked up a lot of slack that wasn't happening from City Hall. I will continue to make sure that we are investing in our neighborhood associations because a partnership goes three ways, the council office, the neighborhood associations, and our community-based organizations. We need all of, you, all of us to be able to make sure that our community thrives. I also was there when we were the safest big city in America, and we need to get back to that because people should feel safe when they walk out their front door. They shouldn't be in fear but we have to do more. We need to make sure that we're investing in intervention and prevention so that our young individuals are on a path to success. Making sure that our youth centers are open on the weekends and on Friday night. That was something I did and clearly they did away with it when I left. I will continue to make sure that when the budget comes before city hall and before the council that our needs are met whether it's putting up street lights, paving our streets, investing in our children and our seniors. And the other thing that I'm a little concerned about is that we used to have a senior center at the Hank Lopez Center that no longer exists. So that particular community of our seniors has nowhere to go. That's wrong and we will make that right. I look forward to the opportunity for tonight's dialogue and sharing with you the vision that I will bring to San Jose. Thank you. Thank you. Your time. Thank you. And now, Peter. Hello, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here with you all. Uh, my name is Peter Ortiz. I'm currently president of the Santa Clara County Board of Education and candidate for San Jose City Council District 5. I'm running for City Council because I believe it is possible to create a better East San Jose that works for all of our residents. I'm not someone who was ever supposed to hold elected office or even make it out of the school to prison pipeline. I'm not the person who has made my career and built my wealth in politics. I was born and raised here in East San Jose by a single mom who worked tirelessly to make a better life for my brothers and I. I grew up in a working class home on the east side and come from a family that was impacted both by domestic violence and gang activity. Luckily, I was able to overcome these challenges and barriers, which I attribute to being raised by a selfless and resilient single mother who raised my brothers and me on her own. Uh, watching my mother struggle is what instilled in me a passion for wanting to give back to my community and those in our area. My love for my community and access to education gave me a second chance at life. Now I have served as a local school board member on the Mount Pleasant School Board, and now currently as president of the Santa Clara County Board of Education, working to ensure that every child has equal access to education and opportunities. As we all know for generations, East San Jose has been intentionally underinvested in compared to more affluent areas of our city. This has had detrimental effects on our residents and our entire local economy. That being said, District 5 is also the cultural hub of our city and its residents have contributed greatly to our arts and culture of this region. There is no other neighborhood in this region that has culturally vibrancy and historical contributions to that of the level of East Side San Jose. If there's one thing that we know, the status quo in this city is not working. I'm focused on the future and bringing new ideas, 
new energy and new leadership to this city. I think that we can agree that we must look forward, not backward. We are at a crossroads and our candidacy represents a new vision for this city, a vision that advocates restructuring our priorities to focus on the basics, addressing homelessness, ensuring public safety of our residents and revitalizing our local economy. But I'm honored to have the endorsement of the South Bay Labor Council, the Santa Clara County Democratic Party, the League of Conservation Voters, the Mercury News, former uh, County Supervisor Blanca Alvarado, uh, and sitting council member Magdalena Carrasco. Together, I believe we can shake up the status quo at City Hall and that we can and must do better for our residents. Thank you. All right, thank you. And now I'll just note that some of our moderators will present the questions in Spanish and they will be translated in English. So if you're on the English channel and you hear a question in Spanish, that's normal, that's expected. I'll hand it off to Norma Chavez now. Hola, buenas tardes. Um, soy Norma Chávez de Vecinos Activos. Uh, empecemos con las preguntas. Cada pregunta solo se leerá una vez porque los candidatos ya recibieron sus preguntas, ¿ok? Uh, la primera categoría es vivienda. Cada candidato tendrá cuatro minutos para responder los datos del censo de Estados Unidos. Del 20 al 20 muestran que en medio de una pandemia y una crisis de vivienda en curso, casi 14 mil casas en San José estaban vacías. De estas casas vacías, 4,000 están fuera del mercado, mientras que hay 7,000 personas, incluyendo familias, personas mayores y veteranos que viven sin vivienda dentro de los límites de la ciudad. A medida que más hogares de bajos ingresos luchan por encontrar viviendas asequibles, es fundamental preservar viviendas naturalmente asequibles la nueva constitu construcción es parte de la solución, pero el complejo y los costos de los procesos de desarrollo significan que estos esfuerzos no, han, no se han mantenido uh, al día con las demandas. Preservar, preservar las, vivienda, las viviendas existentes es un complemento importante para los nuevos desarrollos y es una estrategia contra el desplazamiento. La pregunta es, ¿cuál es su plan para aumentar el inventario de viviendas para preservar viviendas naturalmente asequibles en San José? Y la segunda pregunta es, ¿cuál es su posición sobre la ley de oportunidades de compra de la comunidad? Primero escucharemos a a Peter Ortiz, el señor Peter Ortiz, y después a seguir a la señora Nora Campos. Adelante, por favor. Gracias. Andrea, I think you're about to voice it in English. Yes, gracias, Norma. I'm just going to read the uh, question again in English for everybody. Um, so, hi, her name is Norma Chavez. Um, and the question is, um, the 2020 US Census data shows that amidst the pandemic and ongoing housing crisis, nearly 14,000 homes in San Jose were sitting vacant. Of these empty homes, 4,000 are off the market. Meanwhile, there are 7,000 people, including families, seniors, and veterans living unhoused within city limits. As more low-income households struggle to find homes they can afford, preserving naturally affordable housing is critical. While new construction is part of the puzzle, the complex and costly process of development means these efforts have not kept up with the demand. Preserving existing housing is an important supplement to new developments and is an anti-displacement strategy. What is your plan to increase the housing stock to preserve naturally affordable housing in San Jose? What is your position on the Community Opportunity to Purchase Act? Who would you like to uh, answer that question first? First, uh, uh, we'll hear from Peter and then we'll hear from Nora. 
Great. Uh, thank you so much, Andrea. And Norma, thank you so much for your question. It's great to see you. Um, this is an a, a issue that affects me personally. I, I represent a population that's often left out of our political discourse, um, which is our young working class renters who are being priced out of the neighborhoods we grew up in, especially here on the east side, and are unable to see a future within this city. Um, as your District 5 council member, you have my commitment to champion the development of all types of housing, including market rate and affordable housing in our district, as well as to advocate for anti-displacement policies like rent control, tenant preference ordinances, and just cause evictions to prevent putting people out on the street. We need affordable housing. Our youth and working people need options to afford to live in this city. And we have existing residents who are forced to live with multiple families in single homes just to get by. I understand that we have community members op opposing affordable housing. Still, we must understand that if our children and future generations will be able to afford to live in this city, we must prioritize the development and preservation of affordable housing in every city council district. This is key to making sure that our next generation, young renters like myself, have a shot at having a place of our own to start a family. Now, I plan to partner and collaborate with my district's residents to ensure that our district's culture, our look and feel, and the quality of life is retained as we prioritize the development of new housing. To support the preservation of affordable housing, I will advocate for amending the apartment rent ordinance to include duplexes. I will support lowering allowable rent increases to below 5%, and I will support providing families legal services in eviction proceedings through a right to counsel ordinance to make sure that tenants of affordable housing units aren't evicted in order for property owners to raise the rent, which is something that we see quite often here in East San Jose. Since I started this campaign, I've been a strong and unapologetic advocate for the community opportunity to purchase that. You know, COPA is a true opportunity to have a preservation tool that was created to prevent tenant displacement and promote the creation and preservation of affordable rental housing units. At its core, COPA will enable more properties to become affordable and be owned by mission-oriented nonprofit organizations like those within the CSEC Puede Collect, right? And those organizations will work hand in hand with our city to ensure that these units remain affordable for our local residents and working families. I will also vote for preservation policies such as implementing community land trusts and identifying funding for capacity building with nonprofits who work with these tools to make sure that they're prepared to support the affordable housing units. We must identify ways to preserve our homes and neighborhoods by finding ways to remove these housing units off the speculative market. You know, we need leadership in East San Jose who is not gonna be afraid to do what's right for its residents. And I'm that leadership. Thank you. So housing is a very important issue. I think it's one of the uh, main issues that uh, is facing not only the Bay Area, but California. When I served in the state assembly, we knew that we were going to have a shortage of housing. And one of the things that we didn't anticipate that we was gonna go into a pandemic, but I knew at that time in 2015 and 2016, that we had 4,000 unhoused individuals living in the city of San Jose. I took it upon myself as an assembly member to come up with a policy that would be able to create transitional bridge housing for our unhoused population. Unfortunately, the city council at that time took three years before they even decided to put a shovel in the ground. The day that Governor Brown had signed the bill was the day that they could have started building housing and we could have been caught up at least close enough for when the pandemic hit. We know now that our unhoused population is somewhere around 11,000 individuals. That is not acceptable. But what I did learn from that policy 
is that we need to take that policy and move it forward in creating housing for our community because it will allow us to implement tools where we can streamline our housing process. I will work to make sure on day one that I am able to get a list of the surplus properties in the city of San Jose. And I will reach out to the county to ask them to work with me and the city of San Jose on their surplus property. Because for me, what I'm hoping to be able to do, because I remember as a little girl coming to California when my mom was pregnant with my brother and us living in an apartment and my mom having to babysit so that she could pay the rent. She didn't have the ability to be able to leave the house because she had two children and she couldn't pay for daycare. So she provided a service for the ladies and the individuals that lived in her community. So when I think about housing, individuals in this valley should have the opportunity if they choose to be able to own their own home. And when I talk about owning your own home, I'm not talking about a white picket fence. I'm talking about housing where you can build equity because we all know that when you own your own property and your own home, you build your wealth, which is called generational wealth. And a lot of us send our kids to college with the equity that we build on our homes. And that is the type of housing along with rental housing. And if we can use that, maybe making sure that the city is putting up the land, then we're thinking about projects like the one that I built with Mariposas on Alum Rock, where the city of San Jose was able to pay for the land and we were able to subsidize each unit that cost $300,000. We were able to subsidize $100,000, which meant that we had teachers, we had bus drivers, we had people that worked in retail being able to own their own home. That's the East San Jose, and that's the city that I want to see here for our community. I'm going to work diligent to make sure that we build affordable housing and housing where you can purchase on Alum Rock and other parts of the district. That's the American dream that I believe most of our residents want. And that's what I will work towards. Let me talk about when I was, people are saying we don't need to talk about the past, but the past is really the foundation of experience and how you get things done. I hadn't been in office more than three months when I took on a project to build 3,000 affordable housing units in my district. Yeah, the mayor put a plan, but I didn't wait around for my colleagues to say, oh, I'm going to build a, a, a thousand in my district and I'm going to build a thousand. He had a goal of a hundred of 10,000 affordable housing units in 10 years. I built 3,000 units in my district. Senior housing, housing for our community with families. And that's what I will bring forward. And well, I'm gonna leave you with the last thing because I know my time is running out. We talked about COPA. I know that the council spent some time bringing- Thank you. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Muchas gracias. Con esto le voy a pasar la voz a Erika Díaz. Gracias, Norma. I will be filling in. Hi, everyone. I'm Carol Graciano with Grail Family Services. The second category is education. Each candidate will have four minutes to respond. For generations, our school systems have been impacted by the current global pandemic. It has created, sorry, for the current global pandemic has created additional financial stress on our educational systems and families. How do you see the city connected with school districts and how would you be able to close the gap between city and school districts needs? First, Nora Campos, followed by Peter Ortiz. Nora. Thank you for this question. It is a question and an area that I worked really hard in. Um, I'm gonna go back to experience, experiences matter. There was no one that told me what I needed to do. I just knew what my community needed. One thing is very clear that the school districts have their own gov governing board and their own jurisdiction. But I knew that it was important for me to build a relationship with them. When they said that we, they were going to, and we're gonna probably get to this question later about Reed Hillview, when the city said, you know, we can't build a new library in your district, 
because of the airport. It prevents us from being able to build a facility there. They said, we're gonna take your um, library out and we're gonna move it to Evergreen. I said, that's not gonna happen. I said, give me some time to find some land. So I went to the school board, we partnered at Fisher Middle School and we were build, able to build a state-of-the-art library then there. That's the partnership. I also was able to use the uh, construction and conveyance tax to also build uh, all weather sports fields in conjunction with the school at Mount Pleasant, Overfelt, Fisher um, Middle School, and um, Shepherd Middle School. And we were also able, this is thinking outside of the box, when we were going to build the new fire station on Alum Rock, I thought, why don't we build a fire science academy for the students at James Lick? So we were able to build a facility there so the young people that were interested in going into service with the city of San Jose, whether it, it was in the um, fire um, department or other uh, areas within um, service, that they could get the skills that they need. I'm gonna share a personal story with you. So I was at the grocery store and this young man comes up to me and he says, are you Miss Campos? And I said, yes. And he says, Miss Campos, I wanna thank you. And I said, you wanna thank me? What do you wanna thank me for? He said, the fact that you built the Science Academy, I went through the first class and it saved my life. I thought, wow, that's the type of city that we need to build. And we need to work with our students to make sure that they're using these facilities and that they're accessible for everyone. That's the partnerships that I will bring in working with our school district. I also was able to create homework centers that were in our Alum Rock school districts. And it is important that we continue to build community, satellite community centers. One of the things that we were able to do is we built a community satellite center at Joseph George, Dorset Elementary School, um, Robert Sanders Elementary School, and now they've been repurposed for other things. I think that they're being used well, but they've displaced our neighborhood leaders from them being able to organize right there in their own community. So we need to revisit that. And that's something we have to do with our school districts. I look forward to the opportunity of working with the board in Mount Pleasant and Alum Rock and Eastside. Thank you. Peter. Wonderful, thank you uh, so much for this question. You know, our state for generations has inequitably funded our education system in a way that rewards schools and families for living in wealthy communities and punishes working class families that live in neighborhoods like East San Jose. And unfortunately, our leadership in the state legislature has done little to address this um, inequity. I know this problem way too well. For the past six years, I have organized at the local and state level to advocate for the betterment of our public education system and to increase per pupil funding and grant allocations to our east side school districts. I have toured classrooms in East San Jose and witnessed our current state of public education. I have met with our underpaid staff who work in rooms without air conditioning and proper resources and go the extra mile to dedicate their all to our students. I have sat with parents in their living rooms to hear about their personal stories and the hopes and dreams they have for their children and have worked hand in hand with them to improve the educational experience in our East Side schools. As a local school board trustee in the Mount Pleasant School District and president of the Santa Clara County Board of Education, I have consistently gone to bat to champion the best interests of our children and the educators who dedicate their careers to their development. This includes championing an intergovernmental partnership between the city of San Jose and the Mount Pleasant School District to open up a brand new public library for our District 5 families. Work, working to spearhead advocacy efforts from the Santa Clara County Board of Education to support the allocation of millions of dollars from the city and county to financial resources to close the digital divide. 
by developing broadband infrastructure on the east side and disseminating laptops and digital devices to our families in our district so that they continue to go to school during the pandemic. As chair of the Santa Clara County Office of Education's Joint Legislative Advisory Council, I advocated for a $6 million partnership alongside then State Senator Jim Bell for grant money to establish mental health centers in East San Jose schools that support the development of our students and their well-being as they return to classes post the pandemic. My advocacy for public education will only grow stronger as a council member because I understand that it takes regional partnerships to provide an equitable education for our children, which means collaboration between the city of San Jose and our school districts on the east side. The more funding and resources we allocate to our education system, the less we need to spend our, on incarceration and blight issues in our neighborhoods. Early childhood education is critical for our children's continued learning and growth. Studies have proven that the first five years of a child's life are the most influential in their cognitive development. When I'm on the San Jose City Council, I will continue to work I started on the County Board of Education to ensure that all students in East San Jose have access to results-oriented early childhood education opportunities, including subsidized childcare slots and universal preschool. As a council member, I will continue my work championing the expansion of after-school programs for Eastside youth. After-school programming is an essential resource for school-aged youth encouraging safety, uh, fostering connections, and preventing juvenile crime, and improving academic performance all, all around. You know, these programs can also increase uh, long-term public safety in our neighborhoods. During the aftermath of COVID-19 and school closures across uh, our- Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. I'll hand it off to Antonia Sandoval now. Hola, buenas tardes a todos. Uh, soy Antonia Sandoval con Amigos de Guadalupe y la tercera categoría es justicia económica. Cada candidato tendrá cinco minutos para responder. Creemos que una economía regenerativa es la base de la comunidad. Próspera y el propósito de nuestra economía tiene que cambiar para el bienestar ecológico y social. El sistema actual ha prosperado en parte a través de la explotación, la exclusión y la extracción de riqueza. Requerimos políticas para iniciar, hacer crecer y apoyar pequeñas empresas familiares, especialmente empresas corporativas propiedad de los trabajadores y una distribución de recursos para personas indígenas y personas de color. Y la pregunta es, ¿cuáles son las estrategias, políticas o programas que implementarán, apoyará y explorará para priorizar los intereses de los trabajadores y las comunidades? Aumentar la riqueza de la comunidad y, ap y apoyar y aumentar la propiedad la democracia y los derechos de los trabajadores en el lugar de trabajo. Primero responderá el señor Peter Ortiz, después la señora Nora Campos. Muchas gracias. I'm going to read the question in English, um, but also want to remind folks that our interpreters are providing simultaneous interpretation. So Anna is interpreting in English. All you need to do is click the English channel uh, in interpretation and you'll hear the question being asked in English. Um, but I'll reread it again uh, for all of us. Uh, we believe that a regenerative economy is the basis of a thriving community. The purpose of our economy must shift to promoting ecological and social well being. The current system has thrived in part through exploitation, exclusion, and wealth extraction. We require policies to start, grow, and sustain small family businesses, especially worker-owned cooperative businesses, and a redistribution of resources to Black, Indigenous, and people of color. 
What strategies, policies, or programs will you implement, support, and explore that prioritize the interests of workers and communities, increase community wealth, and support and increase worker ownership, democracy, and rights in the workplace? Uh, first, we'll hear from Peter, and then we'll hear from Nora. Thank you so much uh, for this question. I have built my track record in East San Jose organizing and advocating on behalf of economic justice for small business owners, communities of color, and working families. As a city council member, I will advocate for our city government to center racial equity across agencies and systems in a way that economically empowers communities of color, supports workplace democracy, and enables small business and home ownership and populations disconnected from the economic mainstream. Communities of color have been impacted by the intentional discriminatory policies of the past. Redlining and exclusionary policies have resulted in fewer opportunities for black, brown, API and indigenous populations. In many ways, our government was erected to suppress these communities ability to move forward in our society. To correct this historical wrong, we must be intentional regarding how we introduce policies and allocate funding at the municipal level. Neighborhoods like Mayfair and District 5, the Guadalupe Washington area of downtown, or the Santee neighborhood of District 7 require increased funding and resources to address intergenerational poverty, public safety concerns, and economic opportunity. A budget is a document that shows the values of a governing body. When I am on the city council, you have my commitment to ensuring that our budget reflects these values and that we prioritize the populations that have been suppressed economically in the past. During the pandemic, I advocated for the East San Jose Rescue Plan, a budget package rooted in economic justice that allocated $20 million of COVID recovery to be set aside for neighborhoods most impacted by the pandemic, including childcare slots to empower uh, working class families, especially women of color, to return to the workplace, workforce development assistance for those who lost their job, rental assistance for working families, and 2.7 million allocated for grants for small business relief in disenfranchised communities. In the formation of an East San Jose small business manager to, su to support the development and sustainability of immigrant owned small businesses on the East side. This is work that I didn't do in the past. This is work that I've done today. The number one threat to our family owned small businesses during the pandemic was displacement. That threat is still eminent as many small businesses have not fully recovered or paid off loans or debt they endured during the pandemic. When even though there was an eviction moratorium, many of our small businesses were still forced out by their landlords and experienced illegal rent increases. Now, when I'm on the council, I will lead the charge for advocating for rent control for small businesses and a debt relief program to provide one-time grants to small businesses that experience debt due to hardship. In District 5, we have also seen the vacant lots that attract blight and crime to our area. In fact, we have a new vacant lot that was created across the street from Mexican Heritage Plaza and from the Somos office. When I'm elected, I will champion a storefront registry program for every major business corridor in this city to act as an incentive for property owners to fill their vacant storefronts and maintain, maintain tenants who have existing businesses. Within this policy, there will be uh, language that will provide tax in incentives for property owners that rent to communities of color and cooperatives. Regarding cooperatives, I strongly support inclusive ownership and democracy within the workplace. When on the city council, I will advocate for a comprehensive social economic plan to foster the development of co-ops and the new social economy. The plan will include direct subsidies to social enterprises for business costs and space leases, a city level social economic center to support the formation of co-ops, consulting services for the development and the exploration of an investment fund to support the startup of these organizations. This economic blueprint for East San Jose is ambitious, but we can make it a reality if we work together. Thank you.
my hope and my plan for East San Jose when we think about what is going to happen to our small businesses and being able to make sure that we're creating a space where our uh, families and individuals that want to do business in the city of San Jose and especially in East San Jose is to make sure that we look at the Department of Economic Development and reevaluate and change the way they do business. It starts within the infrastructure at City Hall. If the infrastructure at City Hall doesn't work for the people, then it doesn't work. I will make sure that I put a proposal forward that addresses the Economic Development Department so that they create a dedicated wing of the department to focus on business development and expansion for our small businesses. I will also make sure that we have two designated individuals that work solely in East San Jose along Alum Rock and along um, Story Road. And the reason for this is to make sure that if they have questions about how to access capital, that they will be able to work with them. I will go one step further than that. And that is to work with, I had mentioned with you, the four financial institutions that we have on Story and King, to work with them to make sure that whatever uh, monies that they have are available for small businesses, that we create classes so that individuals understand how to access that and understand the process. A lot of times it's just being able to sit down with someone, walk them through a process because the processes can be very um, daunting for individuals. We saw that in the COVID just to register to get a vaccine was very daunting for a lot of our families. I will also make sure that we work within the department to make sure that we streamline and fast track permitting and inspections for the businesses so they can open and begin serving our constituents. Our community will not be able to begin to get out of the cycle of poverty without a major shift in any quality of pay. I have worked and not just in 2016, but continue to work on making sure that pay equity is a priority. People also often talk about the living wage for Silicon Valley when that happened. I was at the forefront of making sure that the living wage in San Jose was a priority. And I was also at the forefront when I was in the assembly. Why is that important? Because it demonstrates that I do more than just talk, that I am a person of action and I get things done. It is very sad to see that individuals have to work two jobs to make sure that they're able to survive here in Silicon Valley. I will make sure that we create every aspect and every avenue that will pr provide what people need and our small businesses need so they can be successful and continue to thrive. People should only have one job and their other job is taking care of their families and making sure that their children are continued to be successful. If our children don't have a parent at home, then they're out in the streets. So it is important for us to make sure that we're providing the infrastructure that our community needs. Thank you. Okay, muchas gracias, señor Peter Ortiz, señora Nora Campos. Enseguida le pasamos a Jennifer Parra. Y, um, hola, soy Jennifer Parra con Amigos de Guadalupe. La cuarta categoría es Equidad Ambiental. Cada candidato tendrá cinco minutos para responder. Nuestras familias quieren un ambiente libre de contaminación y libre de extracción excesiva que destruye nuestros recursos naturales. Debido a que este sistema económico... Perdón. No se te escucha. No sé si solo soy yo. ¿Me escuchas ya? No, no te escucho. No sé si sí, solo soy sí yo, te, no sé, no sé, te escucho. Sí, te escuchamos. Oh, sí, ok, perdón. Um, sí, sí de, señora. Oh, y libre de extra, de extra. Ok, gracias. 
que destruye nuestros recursos naturales. Debido a que este sistema económico continúa quemando, excavando y tirando nuestros recursos naturales, nos enfrentamos a una crisis climática global. Creemos que todos tienen derecho a vivir libres de exposición a la contaminación tóxica, peligrosa en el suelo que lavan, en el aire que respiran, en los alimentos que comen y en el agua que beben. Independientemente del nivel de ingresos o el código postal, debemos tener la capacidad de acceder a alimentos gratuitos, accesibles, seguros y culturalmente relevantes. Nuestros niños merecen un entorno saludable en el que puedan vivir, jugar y prosperar. Apoyaría a inversiones audaces en proyectos de infraestructura, en, en, en energía renovable, manufactura, ecológicos, agrícolas y otros para abordar a la crisis climática y la contaminación, crear empleos bien renumerados y reducir la inecuidad? ¿Qué opinas sobre la preservación y la adición de parques, sen, senderos, espacios, espacios abiertos y recursos naturales dentro de la ciudad de San José, ya sea en áreas incorporadas o no incorporadas y ya sea oficialmente reconocidas como ta, um, tales o en proceso de ser reconocidas. Por ejemplo, no hay suficientes parques en el Distrito 5. Mientras tanto, una área de espacio abierto utilizada como parque en el Distrito 4 se vio amenazada re, um, recientemente y hay un intento de permitir la reutilización de 114 acres de recreación privada y espacio abierto en el Distrito 8 sin un proceso de vis, uh, visionado involucrando a la comunidad por adelantado. Primero escucharemos uh, de la señorita Nora Campos, uh, seguida uh, Peter Ortiz. District 5 is the most park deficient district in the city. When I was on the city council, I had the Boo Park built in the Sierra community. I also had parks improvements at Plata Royal, where we built one of the first skate parks in the whole city of San Jose. Then we moved to the Mayfair community, where we were able to also enhance the community garden that you see right there in the heart of the community. We also were able to put a skate park there. And then we moved to Hillview Park where we were able to make the improvements with a playground for the students and the children that are there. Making sure that parks is a priority in the district is important to me. One of the things that people did not uh, grasp when I was on the city council is that they kept putting the equation of Allen Rock Park when they were thinking about land and open space. And I had to advocate to tell them, we need to remove that particular acreage out of it. And then you can see what we truly have in District 5. I also was able to build additional parks, whether it's in the Little Portugal area or in the Fleming area. And we also improved Cimarron Park, which is a nice park on the furthest part of the district, closer to the Berryessa. This has been a priority for me. One of the things that was really important for me when I started to really think about our community, our community, we walk, we ride bikes, we get on public transportation. That is something that is important to us. And so I worked with the water district to make sure that we were able to expand and widen lower Silver Creek. The interesting thing about that is that when I was in office in 2001, Lower Silver Creek on our side of town was not gonna get funding until 2010. I went back to the board of Valley Water and asked them to work with us to make sure that we switched the timeline and we were able to get Lower Silver Creek from McKee Road all the way to Cunningham Park to actually get that done. We were able to accomplish that with three different bridges that connected the community And I know that very well because I grew up in the Dovern area for a long time. And I remember having to go through the creek, climb up the bank to get to school where I attended Dorsa. That no longer has to happen. A Goss, excuse me. That no longer has to happen. 
kids are able to walk from a safe place to get to their school. That's important to me. The sad thing about it is that nothing else has happened in the past eight years. We will pick that book off of the shelf and start moving and implementing the vision on what needs to happen on our lower Silver Creek. That is something that needs to happen. The other question that you asked me is that I hope that when Re uh, Reed Hillview is finally closed, that we can repurpose that. And the priority for me, along with the community, is to first have a community process. Because at the end of the day, we live here. It should be what we want to see in our community. And as I've walked for the past year talking to different neighbors and different communities, and we're out in the front yard, and everyone's calling their neighbor to come and talk to me about what their priorities around Hillview Airport is, the one thing that keeps coming up is to make sure that we have playing fields for our community, to make sure that we have open space, and to make sure that our Eastridge Little League finally has their respectable home and they don't have to play outside of our district, that they play right here where they originally have been playing for many years. It is a priority for us to make sure that when that airport closes and hopefully, and I will be a strong advocate to make sure it's sooner than later, that we are working as a community to figure out what that looks and feels like in East San Jose. Thank you. Thank you so much for this question. You know, the, the preservation of our environment is a pressing issue that impacts everyone, regardless of your income level, your neighborhood uh, or nation of origin. That is why I've committed to never take campaign contributions from polluting oil companies. And I never will, because I prioritize the health of our families and children over special interests and political victories. I will lead on the issues of environmental equity from the city council and push staff and developers and other city council members to respect the environment and prioritize the sustainability of the community as we build here in the city of San Jose. In my capacity as a member of the Allen Rock Urban Village Advocates, I have already begun to pressure developers in East San Jose to develop in sustainable development practices including environmental protections, utilizing materials that are non-toxic to our environment, making sure that new development is energy efficient and that there is a minimum impact to the surrounding ecosystem. As a council member, I will prioritize healthy and sustainable development principles when I approve new housing and push developers to include these principles in their project designs. Principles I will advocate for will be solar panels on rooftops, uh, retrofitted electrical buildings, buildings to remove parking uh, as an incentive for alternative transportation, uh, lead certifications, and conforming to the San Jose reach codes. When the future of Coyote Valley recently came before the San Jose City Council, I did not sit on the sidelines. I didn't wait, wait to be on the City Council. I wrote a letter to the city council to advocate for its open space preservation. And I called into the meeting and helped organize to ask the city council to vote to protect Coyote Valley, which I'm grateful that they did. I believe that the most environmental issue, the most important environmental issue before the city council will be the conservation of open space, including Coyote Valley. I will work in partnership with the League of Conservation Voters, who uh, most recently and most graciously endorsed our campaign and other environmental advocacy groups to organize with other CBOs and community leaders to lead an advocacy campaign to prioritize strong environmental restrictions on new uh, development and the preservation of open space. Uh, another major issue that will be an environmental priority for my office will be to invest in transportation infrastructure that will take cars off the road and reduce greenhouse gas. To make this a reality, I will prioritize new development near transit-oriented corridors to be an incentive for tr public transit usage, as well as advocate to make sure that the BART comes to East San Jose. I will support the city's effort to waive parking requirements for new development and advocate for bicycle lanes and pedestrian-friendly trails throughout the district. 
As your council member, I wanna ensure that all open space in District 5 has a community visioning process before their development. Open space belongs to the community. Therefore, its development should be a community process. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Hi everyone, I think it is time for our break to allow the interpreters to rest. So we'll take a five minute break now, thank you. Welcome back everyone. I'll hand it off to Elizabeth Quesada now. Okay, hi, I'm Elizabeth Quesada with Thomas Mayfair. Um, the next category is cultural assets and community identity. Um, so each candidate will have three minutes to respond. East San Jose is a cultural center that reflects and represents the diverse communities that live here, such as our East San Jose artists. We have historical legacies, identities, and artistic and cultural perspectives that demand visibility and preservation. Many of our histories and legacies are in danger of being erased due to racism, gentrification, and displacement. What are your thoughts on supporting, implementing, and exploring strategies, policies, or programs that preserve, uplift, and celebrate the diverse communities that call this city home? First is Peter Ortiz, and then we'll follow with um, Nora Campos. Peter. Thank you, Elizabeth. It's good to see you. Uh, as I mentioned in my opening statement, East San Jose is truly the cultural hub of our city. The East Side is more economically and culturally diverse than any other neighborhood really in this county. This label was established way before many of us lived here, thanks to our region's deep roots in activism, the farm worker and Chicano movement, including the home of Cesar Chavez, the lowrider movement and our title of being the lowrider hub of the nation, um, our thriving Latino, Vietnamese and Filipino population, and the many artists that have called our area home. East San Jose has a plethora of culture and history that must be documented and celebrated. As an advocate and an elected official, it has always been a priority for me to make sure that we uh, uh, challenge the dominant narrative in this country, to make sure that our diverse culture and history is made a priority. One of the main reasons I ran for the Santa Clara County Board of Education was to advocate for ethnic studies and the incorporation of all cultures and histories within our education curriculum. I authored the first resolution in our county in support of ethnic studies, and I defended it when it became under attack by racist voices who wanted to defend the status quo. That policy led to the first in the state ethnic studies countywide task force, which has been working on an action plan to support ethnic studies curriculum in districts within our region. Members of our community must have access to the stories, art, poetry, and history that make East San Jose rich in cultural diversity. When I'm on the city council, I will advocate for establishing a historic district for the Little Portugal neighborhood and Alam Roth Village. These neighborhoods are deeply rooted in history, have unique architecture, and are a part of what East San Jose uh, makes East San Jose a cultural destination. Another solution I would like to bring to our neighborhood is to designate the Greater Mayfair King Road area as a cultural district. There are several successful examples of these districts in California, including Calle 24 in San Francisco and San Diego's Barrio Logan. A cultural district in East San Jose will increase the visibility of our local artists and promote socioeconomic and ethnic diversity through culture and creative expression. But most importantly, it will complement the great work of the School of Arts and Culture um, and the excellent work that's being done at the Mexican Heritage Plaza. Thank you. Hey, Nora. Um, I am in complete support of preserving our historical legacies and landmarks in District 5. When I was on the City Council, I championed making Cesar Chavez childhood home a place on the city's registry of historical landmarks. I say that because it's important. I started this vision many years ago. And when I was in the assembly, I made McDonald Hall a state historical landmark. That was one of the first Latino landmarks in the state of California. 
And I was asked by a reporter, why were you able to accomplish something that other people couldn't do before you? I said, it's called political will. He said, what do you mean by that? I said, I had the desire to make sure that what I started on the local level went all the way to the state and now has gone all the way to the federal level. McDonough Hall is the original Our Lady of Guadalupe Church where Cesa Chavez began organizing farm workers. And I feel very honored that my father had an opportunity to learn Cesa Chavez teachings and organize with him when he was a United Auto Worker, which meant that I went along on the journey understanding how it is important to use your voice for the voiceless. Tierra Encantada, when it was being developed, and mo many of you may remember that that's where Mark's hot dog was at, which is also another historical building. I would not support anything that would actually remove any of our historical buildings. So we were able to secure money from the redevelopment, which was almost $200,000 to literally move Mark's hot dog to its place where it is now, which is on Capitol and Alum Rock. And people come from all over to enjoy it. And it's right here in our backyard. I will continue to make sure that we preserve our buildings. I think another thing that's important when we talk about another historical site for us is the Mexican Heritage Plaza. We know that that was a place that was sacred when the farm workers boycotted Safeway because of the great movement, the boycott. And I remember that as a little girl being part of that. I remember when Chuck Reed said, we're going to have to sell, sell the building because it's not bringing in any revenue. I pushed back. I was able to save the plaza from being sold to a private buyer. But we had to create a infrastructure, an infrastructure for the Mexican Heritage Plaza where other people were able to eventually create a, a structure where thank they you. could actually, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. I will hand it over to, um, do I see her here? Where's, where is um, just ladies? Do I, is she here around? Yes, she's here. You may just not be able to see her on the screen. Hola. Oh, okay, okay, just lady. I'll hand it over to you. Sí, hola. Hola, soy Jasbledi Montejo. Yes, I'm Jasbledi Montejo with the Cuestavamo Igos of Guadalupe and the coalition both boys right, right and vote. In this category is Democrat. Democracy, more profound, the right to vote for all of us. Each candidate will have three minutes to answer. A great part of our community and the District 5 who are born in the, in other countries, many people from our family are a status, mixed status. Many communities contribute economically, culturally, and socially to our city. Many can't vote in regarding the matters of San Jose. In organizing the free way to build a profound democracy, we commit ourselves to build movements and be able to communicate, empower our community profoundly and rooted in the fight for justice, center in ourselves and those who historically, historically had been marginalized. The, the city of San Jose recently did a section of studies to explore the expansion of the rights of both to all the residents of San Jose. The question is, which one is your position in regarding the extension to the right of vote? First of all, we will hear Nora Campos and afterward, Peter Ortiz. Thank you. We need comprehensive we amplia comprehensive immigration reform that will create a fast track pathway to citizenship for all immigrants who have been here in the United States. We need to provide funding to recruit members of our immigrant community and provide citizenship classes. What I wanna share with you is it is important for us to make this a priority. When we talk about political will, it should be a priority. 
meaning that we will need all our nonprofits to be part of this and our communities to be part of this. What I will commit to is making sure that our government facilities, meaning our community centers, are available as we continue to get on a campaign to make sure that we are making sure that our community has access to citizenship through the classes that are in their own backyard. I wanna share with you a story that was actually shared with me about the culinary union, which is Unite Here in Las Vegas. The members got together, they provided funding to make sure that they were able to organize their members and go beyond that, meaning knocking on doors, talking to people, letting them know that they were, that we, this is the union, letting them know that they had their interests and that they could build the trust with them so that they felt secure enough to be able to take these classes. The interesting thing about this is they made it a priority and within a few years, they were able to make sure that they created a path for 18,000 members to become citizens. Unless we invest and we make it a priority for us, it's not going to happen. I wanna share another thing with you. My opponent and I just came off of an election in the primary. 45,000 people are registered in East San Jose to vote. Everyone gets a ballot sent to their home. So it's not like they have to go to the polls. It comes to their home. Most people just put it aside and don't even open it. And as I was walking, I had to tell individuals, you, you received a ballot. You need to go look for it. They said, well, I don't know where it is. I said, where do you put your mail? Well, educating our community on the importance of voting when they believe that their vote doesn't matter is so important. So as a member of the council, we've got to think about how we're encouraging individuals to actually vote. I will make that a priority for me in my community here in East San Jose. And I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much for this question. I've been an ardent advocate for immigrant rights, immigrant rights since I started my work in community organizing and public advocacy. When I was elected to the Mount Pleasant School Board, I was proud to author a resolution designating our school district as a sanctuary district so that our children could learn without fear of deportation and intimidation. I also made sure to bring in SIREN, an immigrant rights organization to provide know your rights training to our Mount Pleasant family so that they were aware of their rights in this country. As an advocate for workers' rights and as an organizer with SEIU, I was highly involved in the campaign to pass AB 450, the Sanctuary Workplace Bill. The new law barred employers from allowing immigrant enforcement agents into non-public areas of the workplace without a judicial warrant. This was in response to the employer intimidation and retaliation against immigrant employees in the workplace. I have been proud to stand with both Council Member Magdalena Carrasco and Council Member Sylvia Rennes who authored the city council memo in support of the undocumented members of our community having the right to vote. What I'm saying is I have the political will to vote to make sure that our people can vote when I'm on the city council. Disenfranchising our immigrant population by excluding them from the right to vote allows for the government and those in power to cause harm to them with impunity and without fear of electoral consequences. It is past time that we empower our immigrant community, the ability to defend themselves at the ballot box. The economic uh, benefits of the undocumented community are undeniable. They pay up to 27 billion in taxes annually and pays both local and federal taxes. And many of them have been disproportionately on the front lines during the pandemic as essential workers are in, uh, and they are an integral part of our community. I believe it's time for our city of San Jose to do right by our undocumented community and provide them the right to influence local elections. Thank you. Okay, gracias.
paso la voz a Elena. Eh, well, thank you. I will pass on the voice to Elena. Elena Cantoral. Hola, soy Elena Cantoral. I am Elena Cantoral with Vegolution. The, sep the seventh category is uh, airport in City View. Every, each candidate would have seven minutes, three minutes to respond. Last year, our community has organized to the immediate close of the, the Red Hill View Airport in a coalition call close, closing Red Hill View now. The 108 acres. It's a news of the, in the, intern, of the urban usage. The second neighborhood they have withstand the constant noise, the risk of air accidents, airport accident, the quality and the contamination of the air for decades. Members of the community require that the site be re repurposed with a center vision center and the community will give out benefits instead of harm to the community that surrounds it. In August of 2021, Mountain Dot Mountain Data Group published an informed in reporting found that the kids that reside within 0 0.5 miles from the Wood Hill View Airport present levels of lead on their blood significantly higher than the children that are in a different distance space from the Red Hill View Airport. As well, they discovered the increase of the lead. Levels on the blood will higher for all the need that was aside at the east side of the airport. The exposure to lead can have impactful, lasting impactful on the health of kids, including cognitive low academic and deficit in deficits in the attention. Definitely, what do you feel and think about the real view closing in part to guarantee the health? the well-being of the families on the east side of San Jose. First of all, we'll answer Peter Ortiz and follow up by Nora Campos. Peter? Sorry, Peter, before you go, I'm just going to reread it in English just to make sure that uh, our interpreters can, are, are able to translate. Um, for the past year, our community has organized for the immediate closure of Reed Hillview Airport in a coalition called Close Reed Hillview Now. The 180 acre airport is an innovative land, is it is an inappropriate land use in the in the dense urban environment. The surrounding neighborhoods have endured constant noise, risk of plane crashes, and dangerous air pollution for decades. Community Members demand that the site be repurposed into a community-centered vision that provides benefit rather than harm to the surrounding community. In August of 2021, a report was released by Mountain Data Group. They found that children residing within 0.5 miles of Reed Hillview Airport present with high, uh, significantly higher blood level, blood lead levels than children more distant from Reed Hillview Airport. They also discovered that the increase in blood lead levels were higher for children who resided east of the airport. Lead exposure can have long lasting health impacts to children, including cognitive impairments, poor academic achievement, and higher risk of attention deficit. What are your thoughts on the potential closure of Reed Hillview Airport in part to ensure the health and well being of families in East San Jose? Go ahead, Peter. Thank you. You know, as we have uh, this forum tonight, Reed Hillview is, is currently poisoning the families and children of East San Jose. You know, I, I currently represent these families and children on the Santa Clara County Board of Education. Uh, and I've been organizing doing, and doing everything I can in my power to make sure that this airport closes. Not, you know, 10 years later or 20 years later when I'm trying to run for office again, but now. For generations, the leaded, the leaded fuel used by planes at this airport has sprayed down to District 5 and poisoned the air of our families. The flight path of these airplanes directly impacts our children within the Alum Rock and Evergreen and Eastside Union High School districts. I have heard supporters of the airport call for residents of East San Jose to just move to another area, you know, just put simply. But it's not an option for our working families to just simply move. For a majority of our residents, they have gone through several trials and tribulations just to be able to purchase or rent a home that they can afford. Our city must ensure that all neighborhoods provide a safe place for our families and their children. 
As a trustee for the Santa Clara County Board of Education and a grassroots organizer in East San Jose, I have been involved in the campaign to close the Retier Blue Airport. I have spoken and attended press conferences and walked the neighborhoods to speak directly to residents and canvass them to call for the closure of the airport. And I did call into the Board of Supervisors meeting to advocate for the, the county to close uh, uh, the facility. And I will continue to advocate for the airport's closure when I'm on the city council. It needs to be shut now. I'm not gonna wait for another 20 years later. I want it shut when I'm in office. Thank you. Elena, thank you for the question, but I did wanted to say that it is so encouraging to see you involved in Vegilution. I remember when they were first just a vision and the director of that came to my office and said, the city is refusing to even give us, entertain our vision for Vegilution. I remember my staff coming to me and saying, Nora, this is something that you've always wanted to do. We were able to give them $50,000 with our CNC money to actually help them get the one acre that now is flourishing. So I'm glad to hear that you are a part of it because the, the vision is a reality. Um, I grew up less than a mile away from Reed Hillview on Adrian Way. That was where they realtors told my parents that they could have their American dream right there. So this is personal for me. And when I stood with Blanca Alvarado 20 years ago, it was unfortunate that her colleagues did not have the courage and the guts to vote to close Reed Hillview and that they took the additional money to make sure that they could continue to have it open. That is unacceptable. That is a system in government that does not work for our community. So it took Cindy Chavez to actually lead the charge and a lot of hard work. And finally, 20 years later, we got people on the Santa Clara board to see that what they were not supporting to close the airport was hurting our community. So I know I have lead in my body. I know my son has it because they say mothers pass it on to their children. And I know that my son went to Alam Rock at Adelante that is less than a mile away from that airport. That is a hard thing for as a mother to say when government does not work and take care of our children. So how dare you say that I sat by the sidelines? It's a personal issue for me. And this is an issue that I will make sure that it happens in my time on the city council, not only for my child, Elena, but for yours and everyone else. It's also important to make sure that we create a vision for our community, that it is led by the community and that we create open space and that we bring our children back from East Side Little League so that they can be able to have that uh, facility for them. It is about making sure that we preserve our community and that we take court. The last thing I will leave you, I'm gonna hold the county accountable for making sure that every resident that lives within that mile, if they wanna get tested to see if they have lead in their body, that they get tested. That is not happening yet. We need to do a grassroots campaign to let people know that they have the right to get tested and that the county has to make sure that they're providing the funds for everyone to get tested that wants to get tested. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. Ahora paso la voz a Nena Duran. Now Nena Duran is going to talk. Good night. I'm Magdalena Duran from Vecinos Activos, the seventh category or rapid fire questions. Each candidate is going to have one minute to answer. So we're going to start question one. What do you think about second question is, can you do examples of two things? to improve District 5? And the third, as a member, what would be your focus to fight poverty? If if Nora Campos can answer first. And I'm gonna read them in English really quickly again. Um, so the, where the next category is rapid fire 
questions and we're a little bit behind schedule so we appreciate everybody who can if y'all could stick around for a couple more minutes uh, as we wrap up uh, today's forum um, so for our rapid fire questions each candidate will have one minute to respond to each question or three minutes in total the first question what are your thoughts on street vendors and food trucks in district five can you please give two examples of things that you will be doing to improve district five as council members, what would your approach be to fighting poverty? We'll first hear from Nora and then we'll hear from Peter. Thank you. Well, welcome uh, to let me have the opportunity to talk about this. I really welcome the question. Um, I support the food vendors. And one of the things that I wanna make sure that we do is I've been had the opportunity to go to San Francisco and in other cities where they actually create a um, space, whether it's a vacant parking lot, or maybe we could use some of the existing park lots, parking lots within some of our uh, shopping centers where they're not being used, um, to create pop-up vendors, food trucks, and the city brings out tables and benches and little activities where families can come out on a Friday night or a Saturday afternoon or a Sunday afternoon and spend the afternoon. We will be creating a space where our community and our vendors can have a win-win, where they spend their money, and yet they're able to try all the different flavors within our community and all the great foods. At the same time, being able to bridge so that our mom and pop restaurants also have the ability to be able to partner with them around this community. But we also need to make sure at the same time that we're we're um, supporting uh, our street vendors that we're not forgetting about our mom and pop restaurants as well. Um, I will work to make sure that the ordinance is something that reflects a vision that works for everyone and make sure that if the vendors need assistance through the process, that it's much easier for them and it streamlines their ability to be able to um, have a, 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 a cart within the city of San Jose. Thank you. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk to you about is can, um, one of the things that I will definitely do in the first 90 days is create an action plan to clean up the neighborhoods in our district. It is very sad that not much has been done in the past eight years to address the blight within the district. When I left office, yes, when I left office in 2010, we left at the peak of what this district looked like. It has gone down. And so abandoned cars, cleaning up the neighborhoods, we will have to coordinate all these services. That is something. And the most important thing that I think I will do is to make sure that we bring back the neighborhood associations. We had 23 neighborhood associations and they were thriving. We were able to give out grants. They were able to move things within their community and we created plans that got adopted by the city of San Jose. So we knew exactly what we needed to do in each community. That's a process that I will do again. It is important for us to give ownership to our neighborhood associations. It's a sad time to see that we only have actively six neighborhood associations. So to go back to 23 is going to be something that I will focus my energy on. And we will prioritize the budget. Three minutes. Thank you so much for this question. You know, I support street vendors and food trucks in District 5. You know, as I mentioned about the culture, um, street vendors are part of what make our district a cultural destination. People come from across the city to try some of our food trucks. And now you can see that we've influenced popular culture because it has become mainstream for everyone to want to open up a, a food truck. You know, East San Jose and the immigrant community was doing food, uh, food trucks and vendor pop-ups way before it became a popular thing to do. And when I'm on San Jose, the San Jose City Council, I wanna make sure that we are investing and in establishing an incubator to support the development of these food trucks, to help them make sure they're, they're qualifying for a food handler's permit, to help them with getting a business license. Um, and I think that there's excellent ways to partner with organizations like Vegolution and other nonprofits like Prosperity Labs who are already doing a lot of that work. And the city needs to step up, uh, uh, make sure that the economy is coming out of the shadows um, and support these vendors 100%. 
I mean, in regards to the two examples of things I wanna to do to improve the district, um, there are two immediate issues. Um, the first is public safety, and the second is addressing blight and illegal dumping. You know, I will take the safety of our families serious by fully investing um, in the public safety through the hiring of first responders, developing intervention programs for our youth, and establishing a local uh, substation for law enforcement in District 5 so that Eastside families can feel comfortable walking in their own neighborhoods. I will then negotiate a contract with our recycling and waste management companies to develop a proactive plan to address the illegal dumping in this district. Trash has overtaken our neighborhoods and it's time that we put together a robust, aggressive plan for its removal. You know, our, our current plan is reactive. It's, it's more of a, a, a resident has to call them first. We need to be innovative. We need to see what options are out there to be proactive. And finally, in regards to poverty, you know, it's something that I know too much of uh, being born and raised in, in East San Jose to a single mother. Um, from the cost of housing to the lack, lack of economic opportunity for residents and the financial hardships caused by, by the pandemic to many of our working families. You know, I will fight poverty head on by developing a place-based strategy for addressing poverty. I will prioritize partnering with community-based organizations and non-government institutions like the Cise Puede Collective um, and all the nonprofits that rose to the occasion when we had the pandemic. You know, I sat um, on the um, Health and Racial Equity Task Force for Somos Mayfair, Ox African American Community Service Agency, and many of these nonprofits stepped up to have food banks to provide services for COVID-19 uh, uh, vaccinations and tests, the Mexican Heritage Pause and the great work that they did. Our community-based uh, organizations already have the relationships, they have the blueprints. Government needs to step up and support them to make sure that we can complete the equation. Thank you. All right. Well, everyone, I, I want to thank you all for staying late. And on behalf of the CSEP Weather Collective and District 5 United, I want to wish you a great night. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Have a good night. Gracias.